Yo, thank you, Foundation. We are back here with another recap of our favorite Fight for the Future show, Foundation. I'm your host, Anthony, and I will do my best to be your guide in this far out show as we're picking up where season one ended with the Cleon dynasty in disarray. Harry, somehow dead but alive, and mother and daughter Gail and Salvor meeting for the first time. This episode is titled In Selden's Shadow, which is a very fitting title considering that everything that has occurred on this show in the last 100 plus years is a result of the machinations of the mathematician Harry Selden. This is a great way to highlight the importance of Harry even hundreds of years after his death, but also as a metaphor for how secretive he was when working on his plans for the future, as our characters try to unravel all of his secrets and also ensure the future of mankind despite the overwhelming odds ahead of them. But first, do me a favor, if you're new here, please consider giving this channel a like and subscribe to keep up with our weekly foundation analyses and breakdowns and enable notifications so you're able to watch these videos right after they publish in order to work with us to try to figure out the mystery of Foundation. This episode opens with Harry Selden monologuing to himself in black and white, which is an interesting moment and an interesting visual in which to start the season. Last season ended with the death of Brother Dawn of the Cleonic Empire, who we learned was an altered clone with a number of differences between him and his brothers. One of his differences was the fact that he was an imperfect clone that was colorblind. Harry is talking to himself out loud, seemingly about what he perceives as his failures regarding his great plan. Something interesting is that he mentions how if he only shared his great plan with others, that maybe they could have helped him. And he yells, you saw what happened to me on the Raven. Harry then says something is happening before he seemingly is dragged away against his will as we hear that familiar voice of Gale introducing us to this week's episode. We then switch to Gale and Salvor making introductions to each other with Gale learning that the embryo that she donated grew to become the woman before her. This rightfully freaks Gale all the way out with Salvor telling her that she's likely even older than her mother at this point. As they exchange information about Salvor's family and how she knew that she was different they agree to work together with Salvor agreeing to call her Gail. Salvor then asks Gail to tell her about herself, her father, her scars, and more, with Gail telling her the history about the First Foundation and the Empire. We then switch to Brother Day, aka Empire, having sex with Demerzel? This is a very interesting turn of events, considering that the last time we saw Brother Day, he was not too happy with Demerzel's actions and her decision to kill Brother Dawn. But something important to consider is that this is a brand new Brother Day than the one we met in season one, as 138 years have passed since that time. We don't even get a chance to catch our breath over this new couple as someone sneaks into Cleon's chambers while they're being intimate and attempts to assassinate the Emperor. Cleon is able to catch a glimpse of someone sneaking in his room right on time when Demerzel urges him to open his eyes. As he does with a little position swish, he puts Demerzel on top right as the assassin attempts to take out Cleon with the sword and chops off a piece of Demerzel's head instead. Now, real quick, it is very interesting that Demerzel was telling Cleon to open his eyes at that exact moment. I don't know if it's just a coincidence in the writing just yet, but the timing does feel very sus. Like, was she warning him? Anyway, Cleon then gets a moment to show up just how capable he is at fighting naked when he throws Demerzel's entire robotic body at his would-be assassin and begins defending himself and fighting back. Cleon shows the man that he's got these hands and he can handle himself when a second assassin walks in with a rifle. Cleon is ever confident and even boasts a bit about his protective aura. When the assassin brings that F around and find out energy and blasts Cleon right in the pompous shoulder. Teaching Cleon a valuable lesson that he too can be touched. Cleon continues to fight back but you can see that my man isn't as cocky <laughs> as he was a few moments ago. 
The fight goes back and forth for a bit with Cleon doing his best to not die, but he gets sliced across the chest with a blade that brings Cleon to his knees. If not for the timely intervention of Demerzel right when the assassin was going to finish the job, the Cleonic Empire might have had a bigger problem, but luckily Demerzel is able to kill the assassin with Demerzel taking Cleon to be healed. Now, this scene is interesting as Demerzel is rushing to save Cleon from certain death, but she's also walking around with half a robotic head and wasn't that being a robot thing supposed to be a secret? I, I might have missed or forgot something because, you know, season one was a while ago, but I thought this was still a secret. Anyway, we have no idea who attempted the assassination and I can't wait to see what your theories are in the comments. We then switch back to Harry, who is still in some unknown dark location talking to himself, trying to get a sense of where he is and what's going on. He's not having much luck when he just yells and screams in frustration when his mind seemingly wanders to a childhood memory of himself looking at his shadow while at home with his mother and father. This moment is interesting as Harry is folding paper origami style, but is fascinated with the shadows. His mom seems encouraging of Harry's imagination as he looks at his 3D paper object that has a 2D shadow. But his father seems a little bit more disapproving as he slaps the taste out of Harry for ripping a page out of that book that he bought with his hard-earned money. Harry then realizes, based on his memory, that he is actually within a four-dimensional space and that realization allows him to travel within his environment with a lot less restriction than he had before. Harry begins walking around and exploring this big empty space when he notices the presence of someone else in the space with him. Harry then sees that the person who is approaching him is his long dead life mate, Yana. Harry cries at the sight of his long lost love and expresses how much he's missed her. He then explains how the galaxy is breaking and something is breaking the future and how he needs to fix it. Harry has doubts that she's real and refers to her as a figment of his imagination when she states that she's real. Yana then starts stating some formulas with Harry realizing that this person in front of him is not the true Yana. She then challenges Harry to figure out who she really is. We then switch back to Gail who seems to wake from some sort of dream but when she wakes up she's not able to find Salvor. She panics a little and dives into the water to look for her when she sees Salvor's boat returning. They reunite with Salvor explaining that she just went fishing. They then begin talking with Gail explaining that she sometimes has dreams about the future. With Salvor telling her that she has dreams about the past. And she tries to use this as a moment to find a commonality with her mom. Gail dismisses it and says it's not the same thing when Salvor asks Gail why she hasn't activated the Prime Radiant yet. Gail just flat out lies and says that she doesn't have the right tools. And Salvor lets Gail know that she has instincts that let her know when someone is lying and she calls Gail out for being dishonest. We then switch to a shot of Terminus with a wonderful voiceover from Gail talking about how things are getting dire everywhere with Empire thrashing like a drowning man. We then see a man referred to as Warden and we hear a weird siren alarm and we're, we're in terminus and we learn that nobody has heard this alarm go off in 138 years yeah this is the first foundation now 138 years after we last saw them with a new generation of people we figure out that the alarm is a warning that the vault that contains harry selden's other consciousness seems to be reopening yeah his other consciousness we'll come back to this the people of the Foundation start gathering around the vault and discussing what the alarm might mean and the return of Harry Selden. They theorize that the return of Harry could be a sign that we might be getting closer to the time when they'll go to war with the Empire. We then switch back to Harry Selden, uh, the other Harry Selden, as he's speaking to the person impersonating his wife. Harry begins trying to figure out who she really is and thinks back to the things that his tormentor, Gale, has mentioned to him in the past in order to deduce that the person who he's speaking to him is speaking in the same cadence of a poet mathematician named Callie. After deducing more details about his situation, Harry is able to determine that he's trapped within the prime radiant. And we zoom out to see it's true. 
with Gale holding the Prime Radiant in her hands. We then switch back to Gale and Salver discussing how Gale trapped Harry inside the Prime Radiant, which confused the hell out of Salvor because as far as she knew, she left Harry back on Terminus in the vault. It's at this moment that we learn that there are now two Harry Seldons because he's made multiple copies of his consciousness. This deeply disturbs Gale and she explains to Salver that Harry can't be trusted as he sacrifices everyone for his plan. And yeah, she's clearly still salty about losing her lover and Salver's father, Rach, to Harry's plan. Salver counters Gale and says that she's just more so afraid of Harry's plan rather than Harry himself and pleads with Gale that they've been asleep for 138 years and they don't know the state of the galaxy but they need to find out firsthand. Gale seems to have agreed as we next see her showing Salver how to activate the Prime Radiant. Gale gets a huge look of worry on her face and shows Salver that Although Salver helped solve the first crisis, that there's now another crisis that is imminent. Harry's original plan accounted for Gale being on Terminus to solve the issue of the first crisis. But since she wasn't there, they're now in a situation where they have veered off the plan and are now in, a, in what looks like a divergent timeline. And the ramifications of Gale's absence is that there's now a string of crises that never seem to end. We then switch to Brother Day healing from his assassination attempt without anesthesia because at this point, he doesn't know who to trust. He is deeply disturbed by the attempt on his life and is so paranoid that he even accuses Brother Dawn of orchestrating the assassination attempt. It's not initially clear how much Brother Day thinks that might be true as he asks Dawn to help him up from his healing bath and they both return to the scene of the crime in Cleon's bedchambers. Brother Day begins asking his security team questions about whether someone helped the assassin gain access to his bedchambers and to let them know he means business, he has one of his guards executed on the spot just for hesitating. As the guards leave the room, Day and Dawn begin a discussion about how Day was absolutely afraid to die. Dawn brushes it off that Day's fear is a result of their altered genome. Now, this is very interesting as this is a completely different Cleon than the one who first discovered that their genomes were altered. This Cleon seems to have an utter fear of his mortality and replacement as he says, more than once, that he doesn't want them to just unthaw another clone to replace him if he died. The discussion then changes to a debate about whether Brother Day should have children and... What? Dawn tries to talk some sense into him about how children would replace them and would end the Cleonic Empire as we know it. This is very surprising as the whole point of the Empire is to ensure the Cleonic Dynasty and a marriage along with any offspring would likely bring a challenge to the status quo and could risk the continuation of a Cleon clone ruling. They talk a bit more and embrace and then Day breaks the news that He's going to submit Dawn and Dusk to a neural audit and view their memories. This is because Day suspects that Dawn and Dusk are both threatened by Day's impending marriage as they should be and Brother Day is clearly paranoid. And still, this development is shocking. The Cleons are at odds with one another. I mean, we saw hints of this with their predecessors last season, but this is something completely different as it feels like they are not in unison the same way as their predecessors were. Could Dusk or Dawn have something to do with the attempt on Day's life? Maybe? We then switch to Demerzel sitting in front of a mirror performing repairs on her sliced head. She seems a lot better than when we last saw her. Cleon walks in to check on her and she assures that she's fine since her consciousness is actually decentralized so this is just a shell. Cleon asks if what they were doing was indecent with Demerzel brushing it off and saying that it's not if it's given freely. This is a very brief moment but a very very interesting one as this Cleon is going to Demerzel for reassurance in his decisions almost as if he were checking for her proof. She then asks Cleon for some privacy as she finishes repairs on the missing half of her head. 
We then switch to a beautiful shot of space and a cool looking spaceship. On the ship, we see two women, one being Queen Sarif, talking about how the rings surrounding the planet are beautiful and they start comparing them with the frills around the neck of a lizard and how a lizard will use them for intimidation. Sarif is a little bit more glass half empty on this and mentions that lizards usually show their frills when they're afraid. We then switch to Brother Day and Brother Dusk debating the fact that Brother Day was sleeping with Demerzel. Brother Dusk seems really, really bothered by the news, that, but Brother Day actually tells us that Demerzel was actually the one who initiated. He also mentions how he was lucky she was there since his protective aura failed him when the assassins tried to take him out. He then mentions how he thinks someone tampered with it and Dusk advises him to open an investigation. But I couldn't help but notice the look on Dusk's face when discussing this. Dusk has always seemed a bit harder to read than the others, but the blank expression on his face when discussing the attempt on Brother's Day's life is very, very sus. They then begin discussing Brother Day's engagement to Queen Seraph. Dusk mentions how she brought such a large amount of people with her, and it could have been an opportunity to attempt the assassination herself, but in the same breath, he mentions how it would be better for her if she waited until after the marriage to do it. They continue talking with Brother Day still expressing concern about trying to maintain the Cleonic dynasty the way that they have, and Dawn and Dust seem to be at odds with each other over Brother Day's thinking and decisions. We then switch back to Gale and Salver, thinking about a way to escape the planet and fix Salver's ship. They come up with a plan to swim down to Salver's ship, which crash landed underwater. They come up with a strategy with Gale offering to share oxygen with Salver once they're on the ship. We get a pretty tense sequence of underwater events that ultimately ends in their success at fixing Salver's ship and getting it to raise to the surface. They celebrate their success and begin talking about how weird things are. And Gail also reminds her that Salver's existence is an absolute shock to her and a development that she didn't get a chance to prepare for. They talk a bit more and they actually bond, at least a little bit, as mother and daughter and also as the last Synaxians. We then switch back to Trantor and into the royal throne room of Empire. Cleon the 17th welcomes his guest Queen Sarath the first. They exchange pleasantries and gifts. Sarath receives her gift and I can't help but notice how sassy she gets with Empire. Her gift is a brass statue of Trantor and the rings she was criticizing earlier around them. She also criticizes that the Empire is surely larger than Trantor and gets a little cheeky with Cleon in front of a large audience. I can't help but feel the audacity of her statement. She's saying this in front of other people? Like, my man Cleon has killed for a hell of a lot less, so my heart stopped when Sarah started popping off. This whole moment is funny, but scary, but funny, and gets interrupted when Demerzel comes telling Cleon that she needs to speak with him about an urgent matter, and it can't be said in front of the guest. We then switch to Demerzel debriefing Cleon on the fact that they were able to find the body of Commander Dorwin floating in space, possessing Imperial Nanites. Dorwin, as we know, was sent to the Outer Reach by Cleon XIV to investigate the comms buoy that went dark on Terminus. We know what happened on Terminus and how the Foundationers were at war, solved the war, aka the First Crisis, and faked the Mega Flare to be able to continue work on the Foundation without the attention of the Empire. We find out that Doran left a message in a neural implant for the Empire that they were able to retrieve and play back. This rocks Empire as they try to understand the gravity of the oversight of their predecessors. Demerzel tells them that there was no Mega Flare and also talks about how there's a galactic alliance on the edges of space that we're previously unaware of. It doesn't take long for Brother Day to realize that this is the result of the foundation created by Harry Seldon. Brother Dusk advises that they crush them immediately. Demerzel suggests that they instead observe just how far their influence extends. Brother Day agrees, but something interesting is the rumors that the foundation has wizards that can fly and all this stuff, and that, that's a little bit surprising. Brother Dusk tells Day that he needs to get his house in order. 
We then switch back to Harry Seldon, that the one that's trapped in the Prime Radiant, when he realizes that the person he's speaking to is the Prime Radiant. Harry asks the Prime Radiant, what is its goal? And the Prime Radiant answers that she has a vested interest in humanity's destiny. But Harry's bothered that not in its survival, so it's not the same thing. The Prime Radiant then speaks with Harry, explaining that she wants to help him escape his prison. Harry comes to the realization that he can escape by changing his way of thinking from 4D to 2D. The Radiant wishes him luck and tells him that she will explain more and continue this conversation if he can meet her slash it on Una's world. He takes the words of encouragement and proceeds to walk out of the door that appeared in front of him. We then switch back to Gale and Salvor who are both in a bit of a situation and are stuck unable to get the ship to operate. Salvor urges Gale to free Harry from the Prime Radiant to help them figure out what's wrong with the ship. But it looks like he's able to free himself and appears on the ship and it's time Harry and Gale had a reckoning and end credits. Wow. What a wonderful return of this show. Yo, I gotta admit that I was late to get on board with Foundation, but I am so glad that I did. This was a fantastic first episode for season two, which promises to be just as exciting as the first. What's going on with the Cleons? We're three Cleons removed from season one, and this new trio does not seem to be in sync the same way as their predecessors. In fact, the new brother Day seems very, very different from past Cleons with this whole marriage thing. Oh, and let's not forget that we still don't know who was behind the assassination attempt and how they were able to penetrate Brother Day's aura. Right now, Brother Dusk is seeming real, real sus, and I can't help but wonder if he wouldn't mind decanting a new Brother Day who wasn't into this whole marriage business. And of course, yeah, Harry, Gale, and Salvor. There's so much to unpack with these three that I can't wait to see where this story goes from here. But listen, that's all I have for this one. Do me a favor. Listen, if you're new here, please, 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 please hit that like button. Please hit that like button. Please consider subscribing before moving on to your new video. This is still the method that YouTube uses to give creators and channels credit for their hard work and effort. Even in 2023, I would really, really appreciate if you hit that like and subscribe button. This way, I know that you like what I'm doing and you can join us every week as we break down into the foundation. Anyway, that's all I have for this one as usual. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Otherwise, I'm going to have to check you guys later. Peace.